Well, Shabbat Shalom. Welcome to everyone on the Outreach Program. Welcome to the Assembly of Yah here in Marseilles, Illinois. Today is the 26th of March. It's a little chilly. We've had a cold weather front go through, but next week it's going to be warming up. Yeah, the trees are starting to bud out and the grass is getting green. The spring is a wonderful time, and the spring reminds us of the time of the Hags, the, the Hagadim, the holy days, especially the Passover that's coming up. Everything buds forth, everything comes out, the flowers and the color and the beauty. Everything comes alive, reflecting the resurrection of Yahshua from the dead. And that he died, according to the scriptures, Paul said, that he died on a Wednesday. And he rose late on the Sabbath evening. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the lamb that was prophesied to come. John said, Behold the Lamb of Yahweh that takes away the sin of the world. Yahshua is the Lamb. Yahshua is the Passover. So, in keeping with all that, and we know that Abib 1 is only about, uh, oh, 10 days away or so, uh, we're going to talk about Yahshua. That's our favorite subject. Lift up Yahshua. Lift up the Savior. Preach this Yahshua in the kingdom, it says. All right? We're going to talk about Yahshua, and we're going to talk about Passover. And we're going to talk about Passover preparation. So we're glad we, you're with us. We hope that you're edified and encouraged today. And at this time, as we normally do, we're going to turn the program over to Beverly for praise and worship. Hallelujah. Turn to your songbooks. Our first song is number 12, Surely Goodness and Mercy. Psalms 34, 1 to 4. <clears throat>
echo number 30. We will sing 30. I will sing of the mercy, Psalms 89 1, and then go right over to 32, River of Life. is out of Isaiah 61.3.
Thank you, Beverly. Yahshua and Yahweh are worthy to be praised. Especially Yahshua, he has done everything for us in the will of our Father Yahweh. He has redeemed us from sin, death, and the devil. He has done everything for us. He is our husband and about to come back and get us. Hallelujah. And consummate the marriage. At this time, as we normally do, we ask you to take time, make your prayers and requests known before Yahweh. And today we have a special request. Some of you, I think, will understand how important this is. In Revelations, approaching the end time, we're not in the end time, we're not in the end time. But approaching the end time, it says that Yahweh will do such things that were never done before or will ever happen again. We have never seen that until this month. In the month of March 2011, there was a major 9.0 earthquake near Japan. Uh, they received a tsunami, but they received major, major damage, killing over 10,000 people. They haven't even found all the people yet in the bodies. They have no water, no lights, no sanitation, no communication, very little. And they have uh, three nuclear reactors that were damaged. One of them at Fukushima uh, approaches a meltdown. There's already been people killed there by radiation. And they say that that area will be dead and uninhabitable for many years. We don't know the extent of damage and the horror that is going on over there. So our major request today on the 26th of March 2011 is to pray for the families, the survivors, the government, the workers, the, uh, the aid that is being go uh, ship shipped over there and the people who are helping and intervening. Please help, pray for them for help, for encouragement, for their needs. This is a terrible disaster that has not been seen in the, in the present world ever recorded. It is the worst thing that we've seen in our lifetime, and it is monumental, epic proportions. Please pray for them. We'll be back with you shortly with our main message. Hallelujah. Praise Yahweh and praise Yahshua. Hallelujah. The title of this message, and this is not going to be an easy message, the title of this message is Baptism and the New Testament Passover. This message is going to be a deeper message. This is not basic material. It will take some understanding. It will take some study. And I can explain this concept, the difference between baptism and and Passover, and is baptism required for Passover, I could explain in ten words or less. But we need to look at the understandings, we need to look at the scripture, we need to put the whole thing together and look at the wisdom and what the plan of salvation is. We need to do that. And without doing that, we will not have complete understanding. So what I'm trying to do today, and what I will do with Yahshua's help, is give you understanding about this. I want to read a scripture and start with an introduction to 1 Corinthians 11, 27, 28 and 29. 1 Corinthians 11, 27, 28, 29. This is a very, very serious scripture. It comes after the part in this chapter Paul is talking to, the, to Corinth, and he's talking about headship, Yahweh, Yahshua, the man, the woman. And then he gets right into Passover, and he's very not very happy with the people who are coming to, coming to Passover they have come drunk, they have come full, they have not provided for the poor, they've come with bad attitudes, and he is rebuking them. And he's giving them a warning, and I want you to hear, please, the warning that is in this. I want to give you this message today, and look at the issues in this, and do it because of love for Yahshua, love for the body, love for you, with wisdom and understanding, with no condemnation to anyone. We're trying to give examples and trying to give understanding because we're in exile. We're in exile, and because we're in exile and the chief shepherd is not here, every man 
does what he thinks is good in his own eyes. There is not even agreement among the elders of the assemblies of Yahweh. So what is a body to do? What is a believer to do? So let's start with this scripture in 1 Corinthians. What does Paul say here? Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread, then we're talking about the Passover, eat this bread, drink this cup of the Master unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Master, of the Sovereign. Guilty of the blood and the, the body and the blood. But let a man examine himself, he says, examine himself, so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup, for he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the master's body. What is Paul saying here? He's saying that this situation, this event, that we partake of as baptized believers in the spring, Passover. It's not a holy day, it's an event on Abib 14, the beginning of the 14th. Can be taken unworthily, it can be taken to damnation, to condemnation, and it can do more damage than good. Lifting up the master, but not lifting him up, coming with the right heart, having the prerequisites done, being prepared, coming, coming humble, having repented, examine ourselves, and I say this to you. Pastors and elders know this, although they don't do very much about it. A lot of believers cannot examine themselves. We come with sin in our life, we come with sin in our heart to the table, and we do not realize what we are doing, we're coming defiled, we come not discerning the body, the body, the, the, the believers, the body of Messiah, not discerning Yahshua in this supper, the emblems, New Testament emblems, not reverencing him, not honoring him, not embracing his name, not embracing his death and resurrection and baptism. We come unprepared. We can take this to our condemnation, not our blessing. This is a very serious warning. So, with help, I'm going to give this and look at some insights and some deeper things. In our introduction, let's ask some questions. And what we're really saying in this presentation and what we're looking at is, does a person have to be baptized in the name of Yahshua and have hands laid on him by the presbytery to receive the set-apart spirit before he comes to the Passover table. The whole reason that I'm presenting this, that is on our trip, our three-month winter trip, which we just got back uh, from three weeks ago, we see people out here, believers, inviting friends and neighbors that they're witnessing to, to come and take the Passover with them when they have no idea what the Passover is about. They are not baptized. They are not washed in baptism. They are not repentant. They're not prepared. It's wrong. We believe that it's spiritually wrong. We're going to look at some scriptures to take the Passover unbaptized. This does not include Judah. We're not talking about Judah because Judah keeps Torah but has not received the Savior. They're doing all that they know to do. But we know better than that. The assemblies of Yahweh and the congregations of Yahweh have received Yahshua, have received his baptism by the elders. Baptism is different than Passover. And one cannot come before the other. You should not take Passover before you're baptized. And I think that we can make a good point in this, and we ask you please to consider this. Let's ask some questions in the introduction here. Should we take Passover and baptize? Should we allow others to come to our home and assembly and partake without being immersed? Good question. 
The issue of taking the Passover without being baptized is confusing, isn't it? We had a couple in another state go, they wanted to have Passover and some believers come to their home, as they did in the New Testament, come in and, and take the Passover together in, in a group. So they were confused about this issue, and they went to two different elders. Now these elders were not in the same assembly, exactly, but they both attended the assemblies of Yahweh. And they went to these two elders, and these elders said that they could invite people in that were not baptized. I gave them a different opinion. And another elder gave them a different opinion. So they're confused. They had two elders say that it was okay, and they had one elder say it was not okay. Let me remind you of something. Let me, let me suggest something to you, please. Please. You can go and get two or even three elders. I don't care how old they are or how beloved they are or how long they've been in ministry. You can get three elders' opinions on something, and they may all agree and you would think you have a true witness. Yeshua, when he was brought before the Pharisees and when he was brought before Pilate, it says many false witnesses showed up, but they were a proven false. An elder can be a false witness even though he doesn't want to be and he doesn't intend to be. If the opinion of the elders does not fit scripture, then they are wrong. We can't assume just because someone is an elder that he's, that he's actually going by Scripture. It says that we are supposed to study these things out, rightly divide the word, and prove all things. Isn't it true? The Scripture is the authority. We hope, though, that the elders will be in agreement, and we hope the elders will give us a good word, a true word. So this even makes this point, number two, more confusing, isn't it? It's more confusing. Who can you trust? Who can you go to? Go and get counsel. There's wisdom and counsel, but the scripture is the final word. Number, number three. Even the elders don't agree. So we go to the scriptures. Four. Is there a scriptural order, order to the calling of a person by the Father and entry into the kingdom? Is there a procedure set in the scripture? Is there an order of things de done decently in order? Remember the scripture says, do everything decently in order. Are there some things that can be out of order, that we can do wrong by the order or the number that we take them? We think that there is. In this particular case, baptism needs to come before Passover. Is there spiritual danger to doing something out of order? Well, yes, because we did read in 1 Corinthians, even though it didn't mention baptism, that some people were coming that were not prepared in their hearts. They were not prepared. They were not in a right attitude. They were not right to take the emblems. That's why it says examine ourselves. Is there spiritual danger? Yes. There's spiritual danger taking the Passover wrongly, inadequately. And, of course, what we're going to look at, is there a difference between baptism and Passover? I'm just going to mention this, and I'm not going to go into it with any depth because it's a completely different study. In the Old Testament, in Exodus 12 and around that area, Moses was told by Yahweh, Yahshua of the Old Testament, that if a man wants to come and take of the Passover, let him be circumcised, the sign of the covenant. Okay? We see a precedent here that before they could take this Passover, they had to take circumcision. Even a Gentile, someone that would be considered and accepted after circumcision as homeborn. But we know what that meant. It was a sign of circumcision. It was a sign of the covenant. And they would agree to what? Keep Torah. Keep all the commandments, all the statutes, and all the judgments. Right? 
So we see even in the Old Testament, even though the Old Testament is a different Passover than the, the New Testament Passover, it was a lamb that remembered Egypt, the passing over the death angel. Okay, we're going to talk about this more later. That prophecy of the lamb to come is different than the lamb that has come now. It is different. It is different because that's been fulfilled and greater things have come and better promises. All right, let's start here in, in uh, chapter part one. What does baptism mean? Who is baptism for? Basically, it says in the scriptures that when a man is called, and I want to go to Acts 2.38, when a man is called by the Father, there is a process that starts. Peter told us a lot about baptism when he stood up at Pentecost in Acts 2.38. You probably have that memorized. Peter stood up. The Spirit was poured out on all the people that had come there and gathered for the holy days. And he said to them, Repent and be baptized or immersed, mikvah, every one of you in the name of Yahshua the Messiah, not another name, for the remission of sins, for the payment, for the atonement, for the washing of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the set-apart spirit. This promise is unto you and your seed and as many as Yahweh will call. <coughs> what did he say? These people wanted to know, they were convicted in their hearts that they had sinned, that they were inadequate, that they were in danger, and they would believe the words that they heard, they believed the spirit that was working on them, the spirit was on them heavily. And he told them, after the man said, what shall we do? Peter told them, and that's what I'm telling you, because there's people that may be listening to this that are not baptized. We know people who refuse to be baptized in the name of Yahshua. There are thousands of previous organizational people out there from California and Tyler, Texas, that do everything, keep the commandments, statutes, and judgments, and deny the name of Yahshua, not baptize the name of Yahshua, and they're not in yet, because they haven't embraced the Savior and his death and resurrection. They were baptized in another name, J.C., J.C. is not the name of the Savior. There's no salvation in that name, J.C. Acts 4.12, there's only salvation in that name of Yahshua. Acts 4.12. So these people wanted to know what to do when he told them. You need to repent and be baptized. So what are the three things that we see in this command, this instruction that Peter gave? He said, repent. He said, be baptized immersed, and it says later in the, in the New Testament, immersed and have hands laid on you by the presbytery, by the elders. And then the third thing is receive the set-apart spirit, the end dwelling. We cannot be raised from the dead. We cannot be in the kingdom. We cannot be first fruits. We cannot be in the kingdom. We cannot be uh, have the indwelling of the Father and the Son in the uh, the part that we read in John 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, every year at Passover, Yahshua says, My Father and I will come and make our abode with you. That's the indwelling in us. We believe that. We are the temple of the set-apart spirit. Baptism, the subject right now is baptism, is the personal receiving, embracing, believing of the individual and receiving Yeshua as King and Savior and Redeemer. In fact, all in all. A man comes and he is convicted. He's led by the Spirit of Yahweh. He doesn't have the indwelling. He's led by the Spirit of Yahweh. This is the process. He starts studying. Maybe he gets counsel. He's going to an assembly, maybe, and he finds out that he's a sinner. He finds out those scriptures that says, All of sin and come short of the glory of Yahweh. There's not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. He, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. There is a man that has a life. Man has a life, but then come and dies, but then comes the judgment. 
that we have all been short of the mark. And we have a death sentence on us. And that man finds that out. He's being called by the Father. And he realizes that he has to be baptized. Acts 5.31. He has to accept Yahshua. Acts 5.31. Him hath Yahweh exalted, is talking about Yahshua, exalted with his right hand to be prince and savior to give repentance to the Gentiles? No. Israel and forgiveness of sins. The Gentiles come into Israel. The strangers come in to Israel and they circumcise their heart and the flesh and get baptized and they become part of Israel. That's the process. But the Father has to call them then they realize that they need a Savior and that they need to be washed clean. So they go into baptism to have their sins washed away. All things become dead. All things become new. Acts 22.16 Acts 22.16 And now why tarriest thou? Why do you tarry? Why do you wait? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Master. There it is, calling on the name of Yahshua. So we see repentance. We see a washing away of sins. We see embracing the Savior, claiming Him as Savior and King, and then we receive the set-apart Spirit by the laying on of hands. And at that same time, this is important, at that same time, that person understands that he's coming in, that baptism is a door to, but not, the covenants. Baptism is a door to the covenants. Baptism is a beginning. It's only a beginning. Baptism, even though it says baptism saves, baptism now even saves, means that the man is baptized and he commits to keeping Torah, keeping the commandments, statutes, and judgments, and coming into Israel. If a man just goes down and gets wet with no commitment and goes off, continues to keep pagan days, not keeping the holy days and the set-apart days, continuing in calling in J.C., the man has received nothing. He's got nothing. The very things that he was to embrace, to understand, to study, and to know in his heart, he cast away. Or either maybe he didn't even get them. Maybe he didn't get adequate instruction. Baptism is the door to the kingdom. It is not the kingdom. It's the beginning because the beginning, I am the alpha. The beginning is him. And he leads us to the, to the middle and the end. <coughs> it's all about Yeshua. You have to first embrace the Savior, give your testimony before witnesses, and have your sins washed away before you do anything else. That is the very beginning. In Hebrews it says, let us leave the doctrine of baptism and laying on of hands and go on to bigger things. It states there that baptism is basic. It's elementary, critical, important, a monumental decision to commit your life to the King, Savior, Provider, and Healer. But it's only the beginning. It's the door to the kingdom. It is not the kingdom. <clears throat> In this process of baptism, instruction, and being really really ready for baptism and being instructed and being ready to make this commitment, the person embraces the covenants. He hasn't done them yet. He's only standing at the door, but he understands that what he has to do, he counts the cost because he's going to lose friends. He's going to lose jobs. He's going to be mocked. He's going to be criticized and spit on. He counts the cost. He hasn't done it yet. He's standing at the door. Some don't go through the door. Yeshua said, you call me master and king and sovereign, but you don't do the things that I say. You don't keep the things that you promise you're going to do at the baptism ceremony. You're not in. It's only the door. Getting your sins washed away and then not following through and keeping Torah, 
trans sin is transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4, you don't follow through, you go right back into sin, and you're not in. That's how that song goes. Receiving the code of spirit by the laying out of hands. <coughs> by the elders. Acts 8.17. Acts 8.17. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the set-apart spirit. 1 Timothy 4.14. 1 Timothy 4.14. Neglect not the gift that is within thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying out of hands of the body of the elders of the presbytery. Baptism only saves if you follow through and obey the king. Because sin kills. The reason we get baptized and have the sins washed away so we can go on in the days of unleavened bread. For example, just an example, I don't want to mix up Passover here, and with a sinless life. Repent and turn. Seek the old ways, the old paths, 1616. Don't sin anymore. But if you don't follow through, if you just stand in the door, you don't go through, you're still a sinner. Baptism is critically important, Romans 6, 4. Romans 6, 4. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism. In baptism, we go into the waters of death and we are buried. We have to go into his burial plot. We have to partake of his death and his resurrection. And even though we do that, symbolically by, and spiritually by baptism, if we don't go further after that and keep the rest of what our responsibility is, it won't mean anything. But let's read this. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Messiah was raised from the dead by the majesty of the Father, Yahweh, even so we should also walk in newness of life. What does that mean? Keeping the commandments, the statutes, and judgments. If we don't, we're sinners, and we're not sinners. First fruits, the elect, the called out ones, the bride, the ecclesia are not sinners. They stumble, we make mistakes, we have to ask forgiveness, but we don't embrace sin, we don't live in sin, we don't, we avoid sin and the evil thereof. <clears throat> Let's go to chapter 2. We've discussed baptism. <coughs> what does Passover mean? Before we can compare them, we have to discuss each one individually. What does Passover mean? <clears throat> In the night of Passover, which is the beginning of the 14th, not the end of the 14th, not the 15th, the scripture says three or four times in the 14th day. We get together, we might have a meal. We read scripture, we pray, we do foot washing. Yeshua gave us an example. We pray over the wine or grape juice, we, and we take that. We, take, we pray over the, over the unleavened bread, and we take that. We sing a hymn, we thank and read scriptures, and basically that is what we do during the Night of Emblems, the New Testament Passover. New Testament Passover is not Seder. That is something that the Messianics and Jewish people do which is not the New Testament Passover, and it is not even the, the Passover out of Egypt. If you kept the Passover meal with, uh, with a lamb and bitter herbs and spices, Seder is something completely different. It's apostate. I don't want to get into that right now. I just want to make sure that somebody hears that because the Messianic movement, which has a lot of false teachings, is growing. And they will have... 500 or 1,000 people, I've heard of one down in Alabama, 5,000 people came off the street, Christians, believers, unbelievers, all kinds of people just walked in, paid their dues, and took a Seder. It was meaningless. According to the scripture, it was meaningless and an abomination. It was a pretense. Confusion. Yahweh is now in confusion. Okay. 
Chapter 2, what does Passover mean? Passover is the entry into the kingdom. The kingdom is based on covenants. We can see this if we go to Exodus 19. He called us out of Egypt. We went through the wilderness. He brought us unto Sinai. And he brought us to his Kodesh place, Yahweh, Yahshua. And he said, I've called you out of Egypt. You were not a people. Now you are a people unto me. If you obey my voice indeed and keep my commandments, statutes, judgments that I give you this day, you will be a Kodesh people unto me over all the earth. And you will be a people, a priest and kings, to be an example and light unto the nations, unto the Gentiles. Which is, we're now we're in the time of the Gentiles. Hallelujah. They were given commandments, statutes, and judgments. The Passover is the covenant, the signing of the covenant. Baptism, we stand at the door, we get washed clean, and now we can come to the table and take the covenant that brings us into the kingdom, into Israel, into eternal life, into the millennium and beyond. It's like signing on the dotted line. You get a suit on, you get all clean, baptism, then you come into the office and you sign on the dotted line. That's what that's about. The taking of the covenant by the body and the blood of Yahshua. Let's go to Matthew 26. Matthew 26, verses 27 and 28. Matthew 26, 27 through 28. And this is in the scriptures three times. He took the cup. This is the grape juice or wine, depending on what you study. And he gave thanks. And he gave it unto them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament. I'm just reading it out of the King James. The word of Yahweh from Michigan. Which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Now don't be confused about remission of sins there. That sounds like baptism. Let's, let's just put that on the side for a minute. When we look at this, this is my blood of the New Testament. The word testament is Strong's number 1242. And the word is diatheke in Greek, diatheke. And it means covenant. So when we read this, he's saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is the for this blood is the new covenant which is shed for many. It's a covenant. You're taking a covenant. It says it right in the scripture when you look up the words. Now, as a side point, because some people have difficulty with this, this is not crucial right now, but I just want to mention it. The word new is number 2537. 2537. And it's kios. And the word means to be renewed. So what he's saying is that I'm giving you, I'm renewing a covenant with you by my blood. As we take that grape juice, we are taking a covenant based on his blood that he let for us when he died. When you read all the scriptures about baptism, there is nothing mentioned about a covenant, ever. This witness of two or three witnesses is specifically saying, I'm making a covenant with you. Remember, Yahshua divorced Israel. And he couldn't marry her again. You can't divorce someone and marry him again. That's against Torah. What did he have to do? Did he, he not only had to die to redeem us, to pay for our sins, to pay for our shortcomings, he had to die because he was then legal to remarry the bride, which he's coming back to do. Why is it called renewed covenant? Because the covenants are still based on Torah in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and primarily found in Exodus chapter 20 through 24, five chapters, Exodus 20 through 24. All the commandments, statutes, judgments are found there. So if we say it's new, that means we can throw out the Old Testament like, with, 
like the evangelists say. Well, we're not, we can't throw out the covenants and we can't throw out the prophets and the testimony, can we? We're not going to do that. All the word of Yahweh, not one jot, not one tittle be done away with till all things be fulfilled. The Savior had to die to make a marriage with Israel. He gives this, this, this blood is the giving of life. Let's go to John 6.54. John 6.54. Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. This gives eternal life. And the reason it gives eternal life is because it's a covenant of life. Because it is claiming the forgiveness of sins, but it's making the covenant to obey him. You see, he's not just promising to save us. We're making this covenant. You have done all these things for us and saved us, and we're going to keep your Torah. We're going to keep your commandments, statutes, and judgments. Okay? If we do that, we have eternal life. That's the promise, and he will raise us at the last day. <coughs> if a man gets baptized and he doesn't do this, he's done. He's out. You have to do it all. So baptism is the standing at the door, ready, and the Passover is taking the covenant. We become part of Israel through the covenants, Acts 5.31. Acts 5.31. Him hath Yahweh, Elohim, exalted to his right hand to be prince, we can say king also, prince and savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. The callings to the Gentiles now. But when they come in, they come into Israel. There is no 13th tribe, the Gentile tribe. There's only 12 gates, 12 pillars, 12 steps, 12 apostles. That's it. And then he told the apostles, he said, You 12 will reign over the tribe of Israel. 12. So repentance is unto Israel. So you have to come into Israel, and the only way you come into Israel, whether you think you're a Gentile or not, <clears throat> doesn't matter now. Galatians 3, 27, 28, 29, it doesn't matter. You come into Israel, the tribes of Israel. Repentance unto Israel. You become part of the kingdom. You become part of the bride. You come into Israel. Let's go to Revelations 21, 9. <clears throat> You become the bride of Yahshua, <clears throat> as first fruits unto him Israel. <clears throat> Excuse me. Revelation 21, 9. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven full vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, come over here, come hither, and I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. That's where we're going. That's what we are. When we get baptized and when we take the Passover in that order, we become betrothed to the Master, to Yahshua. And he's coming back as the betrothed husband to get us. And when we take this covenant by Passover and keep his, the rest of the commandments, statutes, and judgments, we become what is called firstfruits, Messiah first and then those who follow him and embrace him, they are also called first fruits. Passover, this I want you to understand this, please. Write this down if you're taking notes. Please hear this. Passover is only for first fruits. It is a set apart service, renewing the covenant or taking the covenant for those who are first fruits. Ready, the prerequisites are done. Their heart is right. They are the submissive bride, and they take this covenant by his blood and his body. And they are called priests and kings, and will be priests and kings, a nation of priests and kings in the millennium. James 1.18. James 1.18. <clears throat> of his own will beget he us, of his own. He did this. Yahshua begat us, brought us forward, brought us as children. Brought us forward, he begat us 
with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits, first fruits of his creatures, of his creation, of his people. He calls us brethren now, doesn't he? He begat us with the word of truth. We embrace the word of truth. We follow it. We made a commitment to it. And we become, through Passover, a covenant people unto him, first fruits. And the first fruits are the only ones that are going to be raised when he comes to claim his bride. 1 Peter 2.9 A kingdom of priests. 1 Peter 2.9 but we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a Kodesh nation, a peculiar people that we should show forth the praises of him who hath called us out of darkness unto the marvelous light. We sat in darkness. We were in bondage to sin. We were in bondage to this world and the flesh, and he has set us free and given us victory over sin, death, and the devil. That is, the, and to be first fruits, to be priests and kings in the millennium, that is the very covenant that he made with us by that Passover night. Egypt Passover, the killing of the lamb, the blood on the doorpost, pointed to Yeshua to come. But that Passover only gave them protection from the death angel at midnight. There was a whole thing of Passover, and it was to be remembered, a night of remembrance, and coming out of Egypt. It didn't promise eternal life. It didn't promise a covenant because he brought us out of Egypt after all the plagues and he got honor on Pharaoh and all of Egypt and then gave us a covenant at Sinai. Read it in Exodus chapter 19. There was no covenant with Passover in the Old Testament. The Old Passover was to be passed over by the death angel. Hebrews 11.28 Through faith he kept the Passover and sprinkling of blood, lest the, that destroyer, the firstborn, should touch them. Destroyer of the firstborn. He's talking about Moses. Hebrews 11.28. He's talking about Moses keeping the Passover. A protection from the destroyer. Let's go to chapter 3. Is there a scriptural order to the calling, to coming into the faith? Is there a, a, a procedure for this? Yes, there is. The Father, as we said earlier, and we're almost done, we have about 10 minutes or so left, the Father first calls a person. We don't know why we are chosen. We don't know why someone is chosen. Because he says he, he chooses the poor of this world, rich in faith. He, he calls all kinds of people. We have murderers and rapists and people in prison and people out of prison. We have all kinds of people that are being called and answering the call. The Father first calls calls a person to his son to repent. John 14, 6. This is very important. That person doesn't have the Spirit. He's being led by the Spirit of Yahweh to be shown his needs and to shown, be shown his son. John 14, 6 says, No man comes unto me, Yahshua speaking, no man comes unto me unless the Father draws him. And no man comes unto the Father except by me. You have to have the Savior, you have to have Yahshua, or you have nothing. Judah is still waiting for the Savior. They were given a chance to receive the Savior, but Yahudah rejected him. And our dear brothers are going to come in, but they're going to come in last now. The first shall be last. But they're not in yet, even though they keep Torah, because... They don't have the Savior. And they've gone apostate, just like evangelicals. Christendom has gone apostate. They basically have a Savior. They don't know him, but they don't have the covenants. They don't have Torah. Okay, the person is called, number one. Number two, he's led. He starts studying. He starts going through the scripture. He goes to an assembly. He, he talks to the elders, and he looks all through this, and he studies. Because it says, search the scriptures, for them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they that find it. Study so yourself approved. So he starts studying. And he finds out that he's a sinner. He has a death sentence on him. 
and that Yahshua is the only way, and that name is above every name that is named in heaven and earth. There's no other name, Acts 4.12. This is the only person that he can embrace that will give him eternal life and to wash him clean. So he comes and he accepts the Savior. To 2 Timothy 3.15. 2 Timothy 3.15 basically says, Paul's talking to him and says, You've known the scriptures from a child, and these are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith in Yahshua Messiah. Give you salvation through faith in Yahshua Messiah. And that means obedience also. To believe in what he said. The perfect will of Yahweh is, is his son. To believe in his son and what he said. That's the perfect will of Yahweh. Study to show yourself approved. He's convicted. He's convicted that he's filthy, he has a death sentence, and he needs a Savior. John 14, 6. John 14, 6. Yahshua said unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto me except the Father, but by the, but by, and by me. All right? So he finds out Yahshua is the only way. It says in the Scripture, in the New Testament, they came confessing their sins. Right? They came to John for the baptism of John. John said, one that is greater than I is coming, and he will baptize you with water and with a spirit, which we believe is a fire. Then that person makes a commitment with the instruction, if he's instructed properly and some are not, after he believes that he is, needs to be baptized and go into the death waters, the death, the grave, and be resurrected with Yahshua, becoming a new man, having hands laid on him, he is also instructed that he's also making a commitment to follow through and do the rest, counting the cost. Matthew 19, 17. He understands that the kingdom requires obedience and requires Torah. And a man said unto Yahshua, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one. That is Yahweh. But if thou wilt enter into life, notice it doesn't say here, be baptized. It doesn't say, keep the Passover. He said, to enter into life, keep the commandments. That means Torah. So now we have three elements, don't we? We have being baptized, receiving Yahshua, and keeping Torah, which Passover is part of Torah. Not any one of them is exclusive. Not any one of them will save us. It's an entire program package. You've got to do it all or you haven't got anything. It's a total package. It's a change of heart. It's a change of life. It's a change of lifestyle, coming out from among them, not taking of their plagues and not touching the unclean things. We are set apart in a new life, renewed in Yahshua. He is baptized then when he understands and he counts the cost. He is baptized in the name of Yahshua. There's no other name. That's the door. Okay? We see this in Acts 2.38, we already read in Acts 4.12, there's no other name. Then he gets ready to keep the holy days. And the first of the holy days, of course, is the Passover and unleavened bread in the spring. He may want to keep the Passover. There are people right now that want to keep the Passover. It's only three weeks away or so. But if they're not baptized, if they can't study, if they can't get ready, if they can't make that commitment, and we're going to look at reasons why people don't get baptized, they can't take the Passover this spring. And it's okay to wait if you're not ready. You're not out. You've made a commitment. Get baptized when you're ready, and then pick up the rest of the holy days when you can. And when the season comes around again, you'll take the Passover. And you're still walking in righteousness. You're still in the Father's plan. You still have Yahshua. There's a timing in everything to its season. So then, 
he gets baptized, he starts keeping the holy days, keeping Torah, and by the Passover and keeping the holy days, which is a small microcosm, the holy days pictures the whole plan of salvation. The entire plan of salvation is found within the holy days. Understand them, embrace them, do them. Three times a year, Deuteronomy 16, 16, you will get out of your house and you will go where Yahweh plays his name and keep the feasts, those three feasts. We're supposed to keep them all, but those are the pilgrimage feasts. We're required to do that. Deuteronomy 16, 16, please look that up. It's in Torah. He, uh, he gets baptized, he starts keeping the Torah, keeping the commandments, keeping the holy days. And he starts now, after baptism and Passover, the road of conversion. He has to be converted. We have to be converted. Unless you are converted, you cannot see the kingdom of Yahweh. Unless you are born of water and the Spirit, you can't enter in the Spirit of Yahweh. John 3, verse 3 and 5. Let's read uh, Colossians. Let's go to Colossians 3. What is conversion? I just want to throw this in here to make the study complete. What is conversion? This is one of the best verses, verses I have found in the scriptures to describe what conversion is. And you can meet people in the assemblies. And you can tell whether they're on the road of conversion. Listen to what they say. Colossians 3, 1. If ye be risen with Messiah, that means baptized into Yeshua, and have hands laid on, but ye be risen with Messiah, seek those things which are above, where Messiah sitteth on the right hand of Elohim. Your whole thought process where your eyes look is different now. Not down in the things of the world, the things which are above. Set your affections, set your love, set your heart, set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth, for ye are dead, that flesh is dead now, for ye are dead, and your life is hid in Messiah, in Elohim. When the Messiah, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in splendor, we will be changed. 1 Corinthians 15, 52, 53, 54. In a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, in a moment, we will be changed, and we will see him like he is, and be like he is. But that's only first fruits. Baptized people keeping Torah. This is part one of the presentation. Part one of the presentation. And basically we've tried to describe what is the difference between baptism and Passover and is there a prerequisite of baptism first before Passover. And we believe that there is. Why would you come to Passover unclean? Why would you pass, come to Passover if you hadn't repented? Why would you have come to Passover when you haven't embraced the uh, Savior and promised to do the things that are right in His eyes? It's wrong and it's out of order. In our next presentation, and I do want to read as part of the conclusion today, I want to go back to our first verse in 1 Corinthians 11.27. It says, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Master unworthily is guilty of the body and blood of Yahshua, of the Master. If you're not prepared for baptism, you're not prepared for the Passover. Hear that clearly. And if you resist and don't want to be baptized, you surely are not prepared heart-wise for the Passover because you haven't embraced the name. You haven't embraced the Savior. Now in our second part, I would like to give you what we're going to cover just to give you an introduction and give you some interest. Why would someone not want to be baptized and prepare for the pass be in preparation for the Passover? Why? What reasons could there be? Who is the Passover for, which we already answered? Why would a person not be able to examine themselves before the Passover? It says there in Corinthians, examine ourselves, okay? Why would a person not be able, be able to examine themselves? And one of the last parts we have here is 
can we offend Yahweh and deny Yahshua by taking the Passover improperly? Yes, we can come into great condemnation. We pray that this has been edifying. And, and what we're doing here today is we're trying to encourage. We're not trying to separate. We're not trying to cause divisions. We're not trying to criticize anyone. We're trying to show by Yahshua's love, he's, he's pleading with us, please just do what I said. Don't, don't add to and don't take away from what I've showed you in the scriptures. I've given you, I've told you everything. I call your friends now, not slaves, not servants. I call your friends, and, I, and someone tells their friend what he's going to do. Yeshua has made the plan open to us to understand it, and he showed us that there are steps that we should take to come into this that elders generally agree on, generally agree on. We pray this has helped you. We pray that you're encouraged. And all of our understanding has increased. In the name of Yahshua. Hallelujah. The song I'd like to share with you is The Lighthouse.
Thank you, Beverly. That was beautiful. Another wonderful song to praise Yeshua. Oh, yeah. And to give us an example that he is the only way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the master, master, king of kings, sovereign of sovereigns. He is the Aleph and the Tav. He is everything. He really is the one we look to. He is our healer, our righteousness, our provider, our, our king, our husband, our friend, our high priest. He is everything. To the worship of the Father who is above all. Yeshua is our focus. Yeshua is our calling. Embrace him. Seek him with all your heart. This is the season to do that. But every day is the day to do that. Starting the day with him and ending the day with him. In praise and accolades. He is wonderful. He is worthy. He is worthy. To receive all power in heaven and earth. All glory. All worship to the honor of our Father who is above all. He is wonderful. Hallelujah. We hope that you have been blessed today. And uh, we may not see you before Passover. You may not even get this for before Passover 2011, April 19th, <laughs> <laughs> to, uh, 2011. But whenever you get this, we pray that you're blessed and has helped you and encouraged you. Uh, this is a message of love because we just want to do what the Father shows us and what Yahshua has explained to us and please him. We are his servants. He that serves Yahshua, the Father will honor. Hallelujah. Shalom.